thank you for uh, finding your way here. We'll go ahead and get started. What am I forgetting? We're rolling. Mic is working. I think we're good. All right. Excellent. We are uh, doing the third installment of a series we're calling Presbyterians and the American Revolution. And uh, so if you've been here, you know that we are working our way through. We started kind of with just a defense of the whole proposition. There was a time when it would have been somewhat taken for granted, really, that the American experiment in Republican government was a direct consequence down the line a little bit historically from the Protestant Reformation and the Calvinistic wing of it. So I tried to defend that idea our first time together. Last week we were asking what is it in Calvin's theology that would have prompted such an experiment in uh, later history. And so we were considering, of course, some of the features, not all of them, but some of the elements in Calvinism that uh, would certainly give rise to something of what we've seen in our own traditional approach. Uh, Calvin's notion of the sovereignty of God translates ultimately into an idea of human equality, that we come into this world under a sovereign God and not born into particular stations in life. So the inference to be drawn is that all men are created equal. Calvin said that and people rolled their eyes, couldn't believe such a thing would be true. But eventually, of course, it became part of our fundamental philosophical underpinnings. Uh, that equality was in two different measures. We come into this world equal in dignity. We're born in the image of God. We have this wonderful human quality and it doesn't re really matter what station in life you're born into, you have that. But maybe even more importantly, we come into this world fractured to the core. We are corrupted. Original sin has had a ravaging effect upon us. And that's true of the greatest king that ever lived or just a pauper working in a field. It's true across the board and it makes us all equally in need of grace. And maybe that's the core of human equality is that none of us have a leg up as it were with the deity. We all have to fall on our faces regardless of social station at the foot of the cross and cry out for mercy. Well, out of that flows a notion of liberty. Nobody comes into this world with an inherent, intrinsic right to rule another person. This is something that we divvy up based on our collective vision of what's good. Authority arises out of the people being vested in the people from God. So we say, we the people do this or that, you see. Well, all of that's Calvinism. Straight up, down the road, middle of the road, Calvinism, you see. In Geneva, it was sort of a blueprint. It was certainly implemented to some degree, but Geneva's a city, 20,000 people at the time. It couldn't be worked out on a grand scale, but it certainly had a big influence there. But later it was Knox, of course, who was schooled in that thought and got to thinking, maybe I could do this in Scotland. You know, just one man. I mean, what can you do? Just one guy but uh, he certainly was the uh, source of that. And so uh, we're going to be shifting our focus today from then the thought of Calvin in Geneva to a consideration of uh, what happened in Scotland. I, as, uh, as we've said before, I'd like to have our conversation at least have as a backdrop to it uh, a biblical text, and this is one that was well known in the Reformed tradition, and of course in most Christian traditions, it's a well-known text, so I'll remind you of it, but I think it has particular bearing on our conversation today. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians, a second letter, chapter five, beginning at verse 17, the Word of God. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We'll return to that at the end, but let's just have a word of prayer as we get going. 
Our Father, we're grateful to you for the wonderful, intricate, fascinating story of history. We're very grateful that nothing spins out of control, but that all things are working together for your great purposes, and that we can live in the confidence and the courage of that conviction. And for all of that, we give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, well, as I say, we're moving from Geneva, the city where Calvin wrote the blueprint for a lot of what we're talking about here, now to Scotland. Scotland, which had been a very dark land. I know that sometimes we have a kind of romantic vision of Scotland. In these pre-Reformation days, we've all seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Mel Gibson movie, you know, and we think about uh, the wonderful Robert the Bruce and, and uh, William Wallace and all of that. And it certainly was an adventurous time, and I think we can give credit where credit is due, but the fact of the matter is, if you were an ordinary Scot living in Scotland in those days, uh, earlier than the, uh, the appearance of John Knox, most would have lived in grinding poverty and uh, really in a pretty deep experience of what you might simply call kind of a superstitious view of life in general. We mentioned uh, earlier uh, Nathaniel McFetteridge. Uh, these are just a couple of thoughts about pre-Reformation Geneva, or I'm sorry, pre-Reformation uh, Scotland. Uh, for example, McFetteridge says, uh, before Calvinism reached Scotland, quote, gross darkness covered the land and brooded like an eternal nightmare upon the faculties of the people, written in the 1800s. A thinker named Thomas, or Henry Thomas Buckle uh, says, filthy in their persons and in their homes, poor and miserable, excessively ex uh, ignorant and exceedingly superstitious, with superstition ingrained in their characters. My apologies to any Scot who eventually <laughs> may hear this video. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, I think it was commonly taken for granted there was a day when Scotland was regarded as kind of the backwash, the backlands, and that that is simply a fact of uh, historical reference to it. Uh, we've talked about Edbert, Egbert uh, W. Smith, uh, who says, uh, when Calvinism reached Scotland, the Scot people, they were vassals of the Romish church, priest-ridden, ignorant, wretched, degraded in mind and body. And something happened. Whenever I think about what happened in Scotland, it reminds me of a guy that was standing at the Grand Canyon, seeing it for the first time. And that great expanse, and all he could say was, something happened here. You know? And if you look at the history of Scotland, you have to say, something happened here. Something happened. And what was it? What was it that took this land which had been really dark, highly superstitious, and transformed it into the one, of, one of the greatest civilizations in the history of the human race. Again, Smith says, marvelous was the transformation when the great doctrines learned by Knox from the Bible in Scotland and more thoroughly at Geneva, while sitting at the feet of Calvin, flashed in upon their minds. It was like the sun arising at midnight. He says, Knox made Calvinism the religion of Scotland, and Calvinism made Scotland the moral standard for the world. Now he's writing in the mid-1800s, and he's describing what most people at that time would have concurred was a fact of Scottish society and life. And he says, it is certain a significant, it is certainly a significant fact that in that country where there is the most of Calvinism, there should be the least of crime. That of all the people of the world today, that nation, which is confessedly the most moral, is also the most thoroughly Calvinistic. That in that land where Calvinism has had the most supreme sway, individual national morality has had the loftiest, has reached the loftiest level. Scotland in the mid-1800s really was sort of viewed as a great beacon of light to the world because of the advances 
that they had enjoyed since the time of John Knox. And so that's kind of the benchmark we want to keep in mind. I mentioned to you last week the author, uh, the Oxford scholar James Anthony Froude uh, wrote a book entitled Calvinism. He's not a Calvinist. He's a scholar. He's a historian. But he was so impressed with the impact of Calvinism in history in England especially, but also in Scotland. He says, quote, John Knox was the one man without whom Scotland, as the modern world has known it, would have had no existence, writing that about 1880. He says, quote, no grander figure can be found in the entire history of the Reformation in this island than that of Knox. And he adds, he was the voice which taught the peasant of the Lothians that he was a free man, the equal in the sight of God of the proudest peer, the greatest king, the most powerful sovereign or ecclesiastical prelate that had ever trampled on his forefathers. He, says Froude, was the antagonist to Mary Stuart, a.k.a. Mary Queen of Scots, could not soften or Maitland deceive. He was a church uh, authority. He it was that raised the poor commons of his country into a stern and rugged people who were, uh, uh, who were men whom neither king, noble, or priest could force to submit to tyranny. My uh, favorite commentator on this is a name you may recognize, Philip Schaff. Some would regard him to this day as the greatest church historian of history. He lived again in the 1800s. He wrote a wonderful eight-volume series in church history, which I proudly display on my shelf. Drop by my place someday, I'll show it to you. And it's a wonderful for its comprehensive and exacting summary of church Christian history up until his time, which was the late 1800s. Schaff says uh, in his uh, treatment of, of kind of introducing Scottish history, he says, quote, the hero of the Scottish Reformation, though four years older than Calvin, sat humbly at his feet and became more Calvinistic than Calvin. Now, that may seem a bit like an overstatement uh, by Schaff, but actually there's some truth to it. He didn't become something other than Calvinistic, but he was able to take Calvin's blueprint and put shoe leather on it and work out some of its details in ways that Calvin never had an opportunity even to try. And in that sense, you might say, he certainly went beyond Calvin in terms of the application. Uh, and in that sense, it would be fair to say he was more Calvinistic than Calvin. John Knox, he continues, the Scot of the Scots, as Luther was the German of the Germans, spent five years of his exile, 54 to 59, during the reign of Bloody Mary, Mary Tudor, mostly at Geneva, and there he found what Knox called the most perfect school of Christ that ever was since the days of the apostles. He says, after that model, he led the Scottish people with dauntless courage and energy from medieval semi-barbarism into the light of modern civilization and acquired a name which, next to those of Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, is the greatest in the history of the Protest Protestant Reformation. And he concludes, the Book of Discipline, written by John Knox, a manifesto for a Christian commonwealth, a far-seeing vision of universal education for children, universities, and relief for the poor. If we were to sit down and read Knox's original Book of Discipline, I think we would be impressed that you might say even to this day we've barely caught up with him. He took the implications of what he learned in Geneva and wrote this extraordinary piece of literature which cast a vision for what a society could look like. Scotland never got there, but it made a valiant effort. The problem with the Book of Discipline, and by the way, we Presbyterians have, as you know, a book of order, and in it is called the Book of Discipline, which goes back to Knox. It's been rewritten, of course, and updated many times since then, but, but uh, this Book of Discipline that he wrote uh, was so sweeping that the Scottish people, and especially, and this is important, the Scottish nobility couldn't abide it. I mean, Scotland was a typical European nation that had a very tiny aristocratic class that lived in some degree of luxury and a whole mass of people, the majority, that lived in a fair amount of poverty. 
and nobles didn't like to give up that particular situation in the social order, you see. And they realized as they read Knox's Book of Discipline that that's precisely what would be the effect if some of these policies were to be put into practice. So he was constantly in a battle with the nobles. He was in a battle with Mary, Queen of Scots. He was in a battle with uh, the remnants of the Catholic Church. He was in a, rem uh, in a battle with all kinds of forces marshaled against him. But even at that, he was able to have tremendous impact in Scotland. And in several generations to come, as we'll see, the vision that he cast continued to be implemented more and more profoundly. So that it was probably 100 years, 150 years, 200 years after the life of Knox that we see some of the fuller implications of what he uh, put in place. It's a remarkable story. Uh, John Knox, so therefore, is the character before us. Uh, if you were in, uh, in this class that I did in uh, church history uh, some years back, I spent two full lectures uh, treating the details of his biography. Even then, it was hardly adequate. But uh, I'm going to refer you to that. I don't want to do another bio of John Knox exactly, uh, because I've done it, you know, and so it's there. Uh, and if you're interested in it, you can uh, hunt that down. But I do want to do a little quick sketch, a thumbnail sketch of his life, because it does help us uh, contextualize some of what I want to say here. So uh, just briefly, this is the three or four minute uh, quick version, Reader's Digest of the life of Knox. Uh, he was born into kind of a lower middle class family. Uh, not utterly poverty-stricken, but certainly poor and pretty common of the people of his day. But he was recognized as a child, as a brilliant child, and really for that reason was able to sort of get maneuvered into the educational program available in Scotland at the time, which always meant you were being prepared to be a Catholic priest. And so really the instruction he received was in anticipation of being a priest in the Catholic Church in Scotland. And so he learned Latin, he learned all of the, the things you would learn in that connection. He didn't learn a lot of the Bible, he comments later, but he learned an awful lot about Catholic theology and about Catholic uh, hierarchy and so on. He became quite expert in that. However, soon after he graduated, he, he didn't really graduate, uh, soon after he finished his coursework, uh, he had to uh, go into other work. He couldn't, in other words, he couldn't afford the degree. He could pay the tuition, which actually costs less than the degree. It's like going to college and at the end of four years you have to pay more than you paid so far to get a piece of paper that says you graduated. Now that wasn't uncommon in Scotland. And people who had that particular experience, they had the education but not the official degree, were called a kind of quasi-nobility. And so you'll sometimes hear John Knox called Sir John Knox, because that's what they would do. They would give them the title Sir, not because they were nobility, but because they had that education, you see. Well, it was about that time when he graduated that he came in contact with what was then just the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation under Luther. And there was a character in Scotland who was a preacher of Lutheran theology. His name was George Wishart. It was illegal. He was doing this very much at risk of life, and John Knox actually was so taken with it, he became an associate of Wishart and, in fact, a bodyguard. And so sometimes you'll see John Knox pictured as Sir John Knox with a sword. You'll see, you'll, you'll see that kind of imagery. Uh, and he went around and, and really was one of several people who protected Wishart as he would preach in the highways and the byways around Scotland the doctrines that had come out of Lutheranism. Well, as it turns out, before too long, Wishart was arrested by Catholic authorities, burned at the stake, and, and that was pretty common. He wasn't the only one, of course. John Knox himself was assigned to what was considered a fate worse than death. He was condemned to a French galley. So he was sitting down in a dark hold of a boat and all he did all day long was, was row, you know. Most people died who were assigned to a French galley. That was considered a death sentence. Uh, Knox, I think, by sheer grit, survived for 19 months. He survived until the point that Henry VIII in England died 
and was uh, eventually succeeded by his son, who was Edward VI, who was only a teenager, about 13, when he took the throne of England. And one of the first things that they did was arrange a prisoner exchange with the French. And so Knox, on death's door, got out of the French galley and wound up going to England under the protection of Edward VI, who was a Protestant. He was a teenager, but he was deeply committed to the Protestant Reformation, and those who served under him as a protector government also equally devoted to the Reformation. By then, however, it was really more the Calvinistic side of it that had taken root in England. <clears throat> and so Knox, once he recovered from his experience as a, as a, in the galley, became the court preacher in England under Edward VI. He was such a powerful preacher that he actually was elevated to that status. If we could hear his sermons then, we would probably agree he was a masterful criticizer of what was wrong in the world. You know, you ever heard preachers like that? They can tell you what's wrong, but they can't t quite tell you how to fix it. And that's kind of where Knox was. He could powerfully campaign against the evident evils in the world, you see. And everybody would nod, uh, you know, their agreement with him. But he really wasn't quite in a position to tell you, what, which, what should we do? At the end of about five years, Edward VI, who was never in good health, died. And the next ruler in England was our good friend Mary Tudor, a.k.a. Bloody Mary. And all of a sudden, England, which had been heading in the direction of the Calvinistic Reformation, does an about face and heads directly toward the Pope. And of course, Mary Tudor, a strong Catholic, the daughter of Catherine of Aragon, you know that whole story, uh, is doing everything she can to undo the damage of the Reformation. And she launches a fierce persecution against Protestants in England. Uh, men, women, children, hundreds of them burned at the stake. Many others escaped to the continent, and many of them wound up in Geneva, among them John Knox. And so for, this is where Puritanism was born. It's really where Presbyterianism was born. It was th those years that people were banished from England, escaped really, refugees from England, during the five years or so of the reign of Mary Tudor. And God's providence is one of the greatest things that ever happened. But for those poor people at the time, it was one of the most horrific things, you see, one of those odd uh, ironies of history. But anyway, it was there that Knox was in England. Uh, he was there for about five years, and he just absorbed, uh, in a way that we can hardly imagine, the vision of, this was the, this was the positive message. He knew what he was against but it took Calvin to tell him really what he was for, you see, and he just absorbed this vision, not only of theology, but of the implications politically, and all he could think about was how that would play in Scotland. Well, eventually, he was able to return to Scotland, and, uh, and the story picks up from there, and he began to preach and to have this remarkable influence. Now, the first thing I want to note about John Knox was he had a great beard. And uh, some people think that may be part of his power. But uh, besides that, he became, of course, the name deeply associated with the Scottish Reformation, the Reformation in Scotland. And I want to rely for some thoughts about the impact of Knox on a book that was published some years back by Arthur Herman. It was a New York Times bestseller. I imagine maybe some, some of you may have read it along the way. It's entitled, How the Scots Invented the Modern World. It is an amazing document, uh, documentary supporting my fundamental proposition to you this morning. <laughs> See, so, and I, I say that uh, noting this, Arthur Herman is not a Calvinist, he's not a Presbyterian, I don't know that he's a Christian believer of any kind, you certainly don't detect it from the book. He gives the most grudging tribute to John Knox. I've read and reread the first hundred pages or so of his book where he treats Knox and his impact, and it's, I have to say this with all due respects, I don't think he gets it. 
he simply looks as if some kind of astonishing, unexpected, strange thing. How could this guy change things like that? And yet he has to admit it's true. That's where it happened. Well, I think he probably could have understood Calvinism a little better, Knox a little better, might have given a little more credit, but the one thing he does do honestly is admit that where, that's where it started. It was John Knox and the courage of his preaching that really did kind of uh, turn the whole story. So what we would say is that uh, Knox became the name associated with the Reformation in Scotland as Martin Luther was in Germany, as John Calvin was in Switzerland. Uh, Knox became especially known as the man who feared the face of no man. I'm going to be borrowing somewhat heavily in my next several comments about Knox and his impact in Scotland on Arthur Herman, uh, because his documentation is so thorough and so irrefutable that, uh, you know, I, I feel quite comfortable using him as the foundation for some of these remarks, and I hope that you might be interested in some time in grabbing that book and reading. Very readable, very interesting, I think highly encouraging from a, a Christian's perspective, even though that's not what he's really attempting to do, I don't think. But uh, be, be that as it may, uh, Arthur Herman really uh, paints quite a picture of Knox. He inspired, he intimidated, he bullied. Uh, Scotland's uh, uh, nobility. Uh, he was a, of course, his style in the pulpit was so ferocious that you would just say he left in the sanctuary a bunch of grease spots, you know, by the time he was done. Just one of those fiery preachers that you can hardly uh, believe that you're just being, that you're weathering this storm, and yet it was a good storm, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, the impact spread uh, especially through Scotland, not so much the Highlands. The Highlands always remained Catholic. The Jacobite Rebellion and later and so on, that whole story is related to the fact that Knox really never did get much traction in the Highlands. But for the bulk of Scotland, he was uh, a great influence. What did he do? One of the things he did in his preaching was he began to preach in the vernacular so people could actually understand it. These were not sermons in Latin that nobody could follow. He preached in the vernacular, and he preached in a way that would begin replacing what for the people generally was mysterious ritual with intelligible instruction. Now, sometimes I could be construed as doing Catholic bashing. I don't mean that. I think honest Catholic scholars would grant that the form of Catholicism that was on a foot in Scotland at the time didn't do a whole lot for the people. It was mysterious, it was spooky, it was superstitious, it was ritualized, it was almost like incantations and so on, and the people really had no concept of what the Christian faith added up to, uh, given that, and Knox was the one who just kind of blew that away with the power of his preaching. He attacked aristocratic power in Scotland, especially as it was supported by Catholic hierarchy. This was always a kind of symbiotic relationship between the church and the nobles. They propped each other up at the expense of everybody else, and he was a, just, a, a, just powerful in attacking that arrangement. He insisted that ultimately authority, political or otherwise, is vested originally in the people rather than in the hierarchy. This was a Calvinistic idea and it was a transforming notion in uh, Knox's understanding. He began to call the people to what we would call genuine Christian conversion, heartfelt worship of Christ, rather than simply a lot of homage to images. That was really the effect of his labor there. Well, what you find is that as people begin to become more, in, uh, more understanding of the meaning of their worship, you know, if they begin to know what they're doing in worship, if they're not just coming in a kind of uh, exercise in things that make not much sense to them at all, it leads to a desire for and an increasing possession of knowledge. Worship is connected as much to the mind as to the heart, you know? the degree to which we appreciate what we're doing, to that degree we can worship even better. So increasing knowledge leading to better ways of worship was really one of the effects 
of the uh, work of Knox. So he was reading the Bible, he was preaching, he was engendering in the people an understanding of it. Of course, he never preached in Latin. Nothing in the church happened in Latin. This was shocking enough to the uh, Scots people as they began to sit under his ministry. The very fact that knowledge was increasing began to drive a desire to have places where increased literacy could take place so that biblical reading and so on could occur. And so we began to have interest in biblical literacy, reading and writing. See, Scotland was quite an illiterate nation until John Knox. Music came to be more a possession of the people as well. And the music was sung in an intelligible way, so even it became instructive to the people. Well, okay, there's a, a, like a set of dominoes here. Uh, as worship began to be more intelligible and meaningful, it led to increasing understanding. Increasing understanding led to increasing, uh, an increasing sense of power. The people began to feel empowered by the effect of what Knox was saying. He wasn't preaching to aggrandize power to himself, but to really say to these people, common people who never felt any power at all, that they actually had something of importance in the social order here that they had never really appreciated before, that they had the power to choose their own leaders, Knox preached, to choose their own pastors, uh, as we do typically in Presbyterian uh, circles and so on. The people began to become more th knowledgeable in terms of points of political theory. They began to actually debate political ideas, you see, and uh, that sort of thing that never had happened before. And that becomes characteristic of what's happening there. Uh, they began to overrule traditional hierarchical nobility and began to actually openly resist and attack forms of tyranny as they saw them. Mary, Queen of Scots, you may know, came back from uh, France uh, at this point. This was after Mary Geese died, and, and so Mary, Queen of Scots, came back. She was uh, the, the official Queen of, of Scotland at that point, and she ran into a buzzsaw, you know, when it came to her dealings with, with uh, John Knox. She, she was kind of this, about, you know, late teenage or maybe early 20s, pretty, uh, kind of uh, flirt, you know, she had a lot of charm and she'd always gotten along fine in the French courts and, and she was uh, told to go back and she'd be able to kind of sweet talk the nobles and she could get this Knox guy settled down and get Scotland back. Uh, she didn't have any idea what she was dealing with, you know, he was not to be <clears throat> uh, meddled with in that way and all of her flirtation and all of her attempts to get him under control were utterly uh, in, unsuccessful. She had some problems personally, and she eventually was exiled because of a bunch of uh, kind of scandalous uh, relationships that she had. So she wasn't a long-term issue, but she certainly was for a while. Interestingly, once uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, was banished, went to England where she lived in exile, uh, her infant son, who is James VI, was installed. Now, he was only about two or three years old when he became the King of Scotland after Mary, Queen of Scots, was gone. Interestingly, um, John Knox preached at the coronation, you know, of uh, James VI. I don't know how much of the sermon that James picked up at three years old, but uh, one of the things that uh, Knox preached in this sermon was limited constitutional monarchy. That there could be a king for sure, but the king was there by the people's consent, by the consent of the governed was the idea, and that the king would have a role to play, but it was always going to be under the auspices of God's rule and God's law, and that the king didn't have anything like what we sometimes call the divine right of kings or something like that. And uh, so that was quite a, a sermon, you know. Now, James the Sixth, I'll tell you honestly, never bought it. You know, uh, he liked being the king, and he didn't like people attacking and curtailing and kind of clipping the wings of his, you know, monarchical power. So you can imagine that it was always a bit of a love-hate relationship with, with Knox, but he didn't have the power to undo his influence. Knox had had too much of an impact by then, and so really you have to say that as, as much as uh, James VI may have uh, wanted to somehow 
uh, restrain Knox. It was really not possible to do that. James VI, you probably know, became James I of England at a certain point, and, and then he was dealing with an even worse buzzsaw because he had a parliament that was dominated by the Puritans. So the story gets even more interesting there, but we'll save that for a little later. Uh, anyway, I, I'm, I want to give you here a quote from a fellow named Scott Seifert. Uh, Scott Seifert is a historian, uh, a lawyer, I believe, and he wrote a book entitled The First American Declaration of Independence. Uh, I mentioned to you the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence the first time we were here. If you were here, you recall that. This is a whole book devoted to that, uh, 1775 Declaration of Independence, produced by the Presbyterians. And in it, he is recalling how the colonial Presbyterians uh, in the mid-1700s were still living out the implications of John Knox's philosophy. And he says, referring back to Knox and his influence, uh, this, quote, uh, for the new lights, and by that he means the new light Presbyterians, as they were called, or the new side Presbyterians. We'll talk more about that on another occasion. For the new lights, politics and religion were two sides of the same coin, as Knox asserted in his first confession of faith, the right and duty of the people to resist tyranny of their rulers. Knox understood, as Calvin did, that religion and politics are inseparably connected, you see. That's why the state and the church have to be separated, because you have to separate those two institutionally, because, of course, in anybody's conscience, those two are inseparably and intimately associated. Your theology will, in fact, determine your politics and vice versa. And so the very fact that that's true of us human beings means that institutionally we have to be on our guard lest we let the combination of those two become a tyranny, which it often has and probably still is in certain parts of the world. So that's the point he's driving at here. Uh, going on, Christ was sovereign over all men, kings included. So the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland resolved in 1649 that arbitrary government and unlimited power are the foundations of all the corruptions of church and state. Arbitrary government, unlimited power, the foundations of corruption in church and state, and boundless and unlimited power is to be acknowledged in no king or magistrate. Now, I want to drop a, about three dates into your mind here, and this is the first of them, 1649 is what he's referring back to here. By this time, Knox has been dead for almost 100 years, 1649. 1649 is the middle of the Puritan revolt in England. The Puritans took over England under Oliver Cromwell, all of that, for about 20 years. This is right in the middle of it, you see. At this point in Scotland, the influence of Knox's Book of Order is really gaining increasing traction in the nation. Increasingly, the policies of Knox have been implemented. He's long gone, but the followers, the Presbyterians in Scotland, have been increasingly putting into practice the vision that he cast. And so that's what we're referring to here in this document that's being referred to of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. So bear that in mind, just keep that in mind as we go along. That's 1649. All right, increasing knowledge, leads to increasing sense of power among the people. Interestingly, that led in Scotland to something Knox argued for, which was an increasing sense of charitable responsibility. The poverty that was characteristic of life in Scotland became increasingly and painfully obvious to those who could do something about it, and thus we find programs being put in place that would provide for the poor in ways that had never even been thought of at earlier times in uh, Scottish history. So all kinds of charitable operations and, and institutions and so on were put in place, even to the point of providing dowries for poor young women. In those days, in that culture, a woman to marry was expected to have a dowry, you know, and, and many of them were too poor even to have that. A uh, character uh, whose name you may know is Thomas Carlyle. He was a British historian, a philosopher, a mathematician, uh, not a Calvinist, uh, 
But uh, a good historian, and he makes this remark about, about Knox, he says, quote, this that Knox did for his nation we may really call a resurrection as from death. Somebody said once, something happened here, you know, <laughs> when you look at what happened in, uh, in Scottish history, uh, something like that has to be recognized. So that, that's what I want to say about Knox. What I'd like to finish up with the last few minutes here is something of his legacy. Uh, what, what happened on an ongoing basis uh, there in Scotland as a result of the impact of his uh, contribution? And for this, I'm just going to refer to some characters who more or less came after Knox, but carried out, you might say, in a consistent way, the vision that he had cast. And the first of these is a fellow by the name of uh, George Buchanan. Now, Buchanan was a, a peer of Knox. He was a friend. He was a, 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 a guy that lived uh, at the same time, and, and they worked together closely. He is sometimes regarded as, uh, certainly at the time, Scotland's greatest philosopher and historian. And the thing to understand about George Buchanan, you know, John Knox was just a fiery preacher. He was brilliant, he was a genius. His preaching was just an irre irresistible firestorm, you know, and that, I think that's the best way to describe him. Uh, from those who described his work, that seems to be characteristic. George Buchanan was a scholar. He was an academic. He was a philosopher. He was much more measured. He was exactly what John Knox needed as a friend. Because what George Buchanan could do was sit down in a much more kind of uh, uh, organized way, work out in a, in a fairly uh, you know, a thorough sort of uh, work, the implications. And so he did that. As a friend and supporter, he himself, of course, was firmly committed to the same kind of Calvinistic vision that uh, he got from, uh, from uh, Knox. And he wrote a work which is entitled The Law of Government Among the Scots. It was published in 1579, about 10 years after the death of, uh, of Knox. Uh, in this work, he insisted that political power originates in God and is given by God to the people first. This is the fundamental expression of the idea, the consent of the governed, that nobody comes into this world having some sort of superior status by nature, that the authority is granted by God to the people, and then the people have the right to assign that authority for a time to people they deem worthy of it. So Buchanan said the people have the right to confer royal authority on whomever they wish. They can confer the authority, they can also revoke the authority. You see, this was the point, that uh, there was no such thing as an automatic right to rule, and if the people finally reached the point of saying, wait a minute, the authority we've given you is now being abused by you, then we can revoke your authority. See, that was, that was kind of a radical idea. Calvin said it first, but it took Buchanan to sort of put shoe leather on it in the way that government was done there in, uh, in, in Scotland. Arthur Herman, uh, how the Scots invented the modern world, says this of Buchanan, quote, this is the sort of view we are used to ascribing to John Locke. In fact, it belongs to a Presbyterian Scot, from uh, Stirlingshire, writing more than 100 years earlier. You know that John Locke was a very influential philosopher, English, wrote a treatise on human government, was very influential at the time of the framing of the Constitution, but he didn't say much more than what George Buchanan had said uh, some 100 years earlier. Now, John Locke himself was not a Puritan, but his father was, and he was the descendant of a long line of Puritans, and so we have to say it was somewhat in his DNA, regardless of his uh, particular religious affiliations. Uh, <clears throat> the Scottish people, uh, as a result of this influence, began to uh, be involved with a, in, a, in a great deal of, you might say, political conversation. And this increasingly dominated uh, the waterfront, you might say, in Scotland. Another character of interest is uh, Gilbert Burnett. He was an Englishman.
He was very well known in his day, this is the 1600s. As a, as a teenager, he visited Scotland. And he was astonished. Now, this is a teenager, this fellow who uh, was uh, pretty famous later, but this was before he was well known, uh, traveled around Scotland. Now, this is amid the, uh, the, this is 1660. I gave you 1647 earlier, this is 1660. It's about 10 years later. Critical date. This is when you might say Scottish Presbyterianism had reached its apex of influence in Scotland, and it was just before what are called the killing times in Scotland, when there was a renewed persecution against Presbyterians in Scotland because of the restoration of the monarchy in England. So for 20 years, you've got the Puritan revolt, it ends, the English people, it's too much too fast. They bring back Charles II, son of the executed Charles I, and he immediately launches a campaign of persecution against our Presbyterian forebears in Scotland, so ferocious it came to be nicknamed the Killing Time. It lasted for about 30 years. That was the period when massive numbers of Presbyterian Scottish people fled to the colonies. And so, in many ways, the people who were coming here, and they came in the hundreds of thousands, were in fact escaping from a time of vicious persecution in Scotland uh, during that 30 years or so. Well, it's right before that, 1660 is like the turning point that our friend here, uh, Gilbert Burnett, was visiting Scotland, and he says this. Uh, he says, quote, we are indeed amazed to see a poor commonality so capable to argue upon points of government. He'd go into a local alehouse and find people there drinking their beer and debating over points of theology from their Bibles and applying it to political theory. You see, well, what is this? Who are these people? That was kind of the effect he had, you know. Uh, and uh, on the bounds to be set on the power of princes. He says, upon all these topics, they had texts of scripture in hand, and they were ready with their answers to anything that was said to them. This measure of knowledge was spread even amongst the meanest of them, their cottagers and servants. He couldn't believe the degree of sophistication of the ordinary folks there in Scotland at this time. This is 1660 Scotland uh, that he's being, that's being observed. Uh, Arthur Herman mentions David Hume. No one will accuse him of being a, a ferocious uh, Calvinist, let alone, uh, or I should say a Christian, let alone a Calvinist. But even David Hume uh, notes the impact of the legacy of, of Knox when he says, quote, uh, the religion of Knox, quote, consecrated every individual and in his own eyes bestowed a character on him much superior to what forms and ceremonious institutions could alone confirm. John Knox created and later generations implemented all, you know, universal education. We are now at 1696, okay? 1660, the killing times. 1688 in England, the glorious revolution. William and Mary, things change. Constitutional monarchy. It's never been the same since in England. That was a transforming moment when you might say the long-term effects of Puritanism in England took effect. And now we return to what happened in Scotland and the people that stayed in Scotland and survived picked up where things had left off earlier and began to continue a campaign of developing this vision from John Knox. And they enacted the Schools Act in, uh, in 1696 which led to an explosion of literacy. This again is from Arthur Herman, who says, in 1696, Scotland's parliament, influenced by its Presbyterian vision, passed an act for setting schools, mandating a school in every parish, and pay for the teacher. Universal education, and if you can't afford it, the church will pick up the tab. You see, that was the notion that was uh, promulgated there and being implemented at this point in Scottish history. Herman says, quote, the reason was the Presbyterian conviction that everyone should be able to read the scriptures. Based on Knox's 1560 Book of Discipline, 
so 150 years earlier. And the first statute to that effect was in 1640. Now this act was to reinforce it. The effect of that, in 1700, Scotland was universally recognized as the most modern nation in Europe, the most literate, I should say, nation in Europe and maybe even in the world. This was the long-term effect of a vision of what a society ought to look like, you see, coming courtesy of the preaching of John Knox. England, by the way, didn't catch up to comparable literacy until about 1880. This is all from Arthur Herman, so he gives the documentation for this if you want to go and check that out. Uh, it was the case in 1700, if you toured around Scotland at that time, every private home would have a little collection of books. They all had a library of some sort, some with very uh, impressive and sophisticated uh, volumes in it. Every town had a lending library. Uh, and when you go back and read the records of those libraries, the books were being loaned not to scholars, college professors, but they were being loaned to bakers, to blacksmiths, to farmers. This was a literate society, you see, a sophisticated literate society. And we trace it all back to the impact that came uh, much earlier in those days that uh, we've talked about. Industries popped up in Scotland at that time, mainly designed to serve a literate population. So paper manufacturing, that sort of thing, took place as well. <clears throat> I don't really have to labor too much how famous became the institutions of higher learning in Scotland. Uh, St. Andrews University, Edinburgh University became world famous. They, you know, basically were viewed as the very best institutions that a person could uh, possibly attend if they could get into them. Uh, Glasgow University, uh, where most of the students were not wealthy, were not upper crust, they were lower class or middle class students. Uh, there's a whole history of Scottish thinkers that can be traced back to this influence uh, in Scotland. We think about, for example, uh, Samuel Rutherford. I just uh, I'll go back to Samuel Rutherford and uh, his great book, Lex Rex, which I've mentioned to you before, was very important in the uh, constitutional era of the United States. Law is king countering the notion that king is law. He was a Scottish Presbyterian. Uh, we have Adam Smith, the inventor of modern economics, was a Scot Presbyterian, and uh, he gave kind of an implementation to those views uh, in terms of the discipline of economics. And uh, Robert Burns, the famous poet, uh, and others. So, you know, all of these could be named. I'm, I'm having to cut this uh, much shorter than it could be, but uh, for the sake of uh, your toleration and time and so on, I'm going to do that. You just get the idea. You know, something happened here, and uh, Scotland somehow was catapulted from this dark place to the most uh, advanced civilization you might probably in the whole world for a time. But what happened? That same birth was then transplanted again, again in the providence of God under persecution. It was driven to the new world, and those Scottish people, 900,000 of them here in the colonies before the Revolutionary War, together with a lot of Puritans, were in many ways uh, kind of the driving force that began to uh, call for uh, true independence, and we'll be tracing that story through a little bit more as we go along. All right, back to our verse here, uh, and we'll wrap up with this. Uh, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, all things have passed, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, if I can uh, give you number one, in Christ we live in a new heaven and a new earth personally. Uh, through Christ who has given us new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Quoting 1 Peter chapter 1. A new heavens and a new earth we commonly think of as a future thing, and rightly so. But from a biblical point of view, it all began in the first century. When Christ accomplished the great works of the gospel, he established his kingdom, and in some ways we would say that was the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth. And so if you are in Christ, you are part of that new heaven and a new earth. You've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. 
And throughout history, Christian people have believed that we're in the process of building that kingdom, increasingly trying to realize in history a new heaven and a new earth. When John Winthrop got up one day and preached in Massachusetts Bay that we are establishing a city on a hill, a city that is going to be seen and recognized around the world. He was preaching straight out of this thought that we are making another great step in the direction of a new heaven and a new earth. And so that is at least part of what uh, informs the thoughts we've had here. In Christ, we live in a new heaven and a new earth politically. As the reign of Christ extends to all human government because he is the one who rules the kings of the earth. As John says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, uh, there are two kinds of rulers of the earth in this world. There are the kind that recognize King Jesus and the kind that don't. Have you noticed? There are the kind that say, my position as a ruler is utterly and absolutely subservient to the rule of Christ. That would be a common view at the revolutionary era. It's not hard to prove that. That can be demonstrated repeatedly ad nauseum. Uh, that there was a recognition that Christ is the king and our rule here must be subservient to his authority and therefore play by his rules. Not everybody sees it that way. Some kings of the earth take their stand against the Lord and against his authority. And of course, we might think that God got a little upset about that. When they say, let's cast off their shackles, let's escape from the burden of obeying this God of heaven and earth, the one who sits in heaven does what? He scoffs. He says, well, good luck with that, you see, because I have set my son on Mount Zion. And so there is an idea in a new heavens and a new earth that there is a proper authority in it and that politics ought to recognize that authority. However that translates in the particulars of you know, political theory, it all has to begin with the fact that there is truly, objectively and really, an authority in heaven and that the authorities on earth are subservient to that great authority. And finally, in Christ, we live in a new heavens and a new earth eternally because our lives are hid in Christ and when he appears, we shall be like him, seeing him as he is. We have a past, a present, and a future, and our great task at this moment is to work together, as John Knox did and many others, uh, to the end of building that kingdom and realizing more and more that new heaven and a new earth until the time comes, as I like to say, until when the knowledge of God covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Questions, thoughts, footnotes? Bruce. <laughs> no, actually. I... <laughs> Calvinism, okay, uh, yeah, just, just this. I mentioned to you, yeah, yeah, I mentioned to you that under Bloody Mary, right, Mary Tudor, about a five-year reign before Elizabeth, she, she had a, a persecution of Protestants in England. Many were killed many more fled. Puritanism really had its beginnings in that five-year period when these people were in, in various refugee cities in, in, uh, in, in, on the continent, but many of them, with John Knox, were in Geneva. And so you might say that while they had an understanding, they were generally following a Calvinistic theology, that was where they got really up close and personal. That's, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. I'm sorry? The ism. Yeah, what is the basis? Uh, oh, Calvinism? Yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't yeah. Um, really quick. Really quick. <laughs> well, yeah, last, year, or last week I did kind of talk about what was it in Calvin that would have given rise to a vision of a political theory. And, uh, and of course, Calvinism is much broader than simply his politics. But it was a heavy emphasis on God's sovereignty, and that translated into an equally strong emphasis on human equality. So Calvin was really the first voice in history to say people come into this world equal, equal in dignity, equal in need, 
And that's critically important, equal in potential dignity made in the image of God, but equal in desperate need because we're sinful and lost and helpless. And whether your name is Henry VIII or Joe the plumber, it's the same need, you see. And, uh, and so that, that, was, that, that has implications theologically, personally, has implications politically. And that was where John Knox wanted to go with it. And the fact that we all come into this world equal on all of those measures means that we all come into this world equally free. Nobody has a right to rule and nobody comes in inherently a slave, you see. And so Knox, or, uh, Calvin gives us that. The first great, probably anti-slavery theology in history comes straight from John Calvin. Now it's taken history a long time to figure that out and work it out, but the fact is the, the seeds of it were pretty clearly there. I'm hoping that's kind of getting at your, it's an impossible question to do that, that rapidly. But anybody else? Phil, yeah. Where was uh, Knox preaching? Was he, was he, was his ministry clandestine? Was no, 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 he was preaching openly. Uh, St. Uh, G- is it Giles? St. Church. Yeah, in churches, yeah. One in, in uh, Edinburgh, in, Edinburgh in particular, uh, but he traveled around. He preached all through Scotland, but most of his, his mainstay was in, in the major capital city there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to say G-I-L-E-S. I don't know how to say that. How do you say it? Is it Giles? I think it is. Yeah. But elsewhere as well. Anybody else? Before I... let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Our Father, we're grateful for your mercies to us. We thank you for the characters that we've thought about this morning, for John Knox in particular. We thank you for your great work in his life and the fact that we are still the heirs of the contribution that he made by your grace. We pray that as we continue to think about how you've called us to live out our lives of faith at this time in history, that we would do so with equal fervency, committed to the proposition that Christ himself is Lord and King, the ruler of the kings of the earth, and the one to whom our absolute and final allegiance is due. We give you thanks for that in the name of Christ, amen.